Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> How are you guys doing today? Good, 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 Orlando. Good, thanks. Good. So we do have news, and some of them are very good news. And we're going to be uh, explaining to you guys about all these new forms. <clears throat> so let's see who we have here. Let's wait a little longer before we start it. All right, guys, as we all know, with this lawsuit against NAR, there were some changes. And we already addressed to a lot of all those changes. Actually, we addressed to all the changes because the only thing that changed was two things. It was that the commission paid to the cooperating broker cannot be disclosed on the MLS. That's rule number one. And rule number two is the new buyer's brokerage agreement. So every single buyer must have a brokerage agreement with the broker. So this is what we're going to see today. We already covered the other changes. They already released the two forms <clears throat> for buyer uh, broker to broker commission agreement and seller to buyer's broker commission agreement. We already covered that in our last meeting. <clears throat> and today we're going to cover the new buyer's brokerage agreement. Okay. Now, what is good about this? Number one is that every single buyer are going to have to sign this form. There is no way, there is no possibility that a buyer can work with an agent without this form to be signed. So before, we always want the buyer to sign this, but we know that it would be hard to get the buyer to sign because there are a lot of agents that would not require buyers to sign. And this form, let me tell you, this form provides a great protection to the broker, to the agents. Great protection. It protects the agent more than protects the buyer. That's why we always want the buyer to sign it. But because not everybody was requesting buyers to sign it, we just did not request the buyer to sign this agreement. But now that became a rule and all the buyers must sign the agreement, that is good. Because now you can request the buyer to sign. And if he refuses to sign with you, he's still going to have to sign with somebody else. So when you are talking to the buyer and show him the 
agreement, you're going to tell him, look, regardless of who you're selling, uh, working with, <clears throat> you're going to have to sign this agreement. So we're going to look into all the details of the agreement and the things that we can do, how we're going to present ourselves to the buyers and um, how we're going to convince the seller to sign this document. Number one is because if they don't sign it, they cannot be represented. If they don't sign, they cannot go see properties. This agreement must be signed with the buyer before you show properties to the buyer. So he's going to have to sign it regardless. Okay. So John is here with us and we spend a lot of time together. Today, we spend almost an hour this, the, uh, talking about this uh, new agreement. We were reading all the agreements. We were looking into all the details. Uh, yesterday, we were almost one hour on the holding and waiting to talk to the attorneys of the Florida uh, Association of Realtors just to get all the information that we need to know about this form so we can pass them to you. John, thank you again for being a great support to our company and to all our agents. Thank you for the time that you've been dedicated with me to get all this thing done and put it together this meeting. John, thank you again. So the word is yours. Yeah, hi, Orlando, thank you. Hi, everyone. Yeah, as Arlindo mentioned, this new form is hot off the press. This just came from the Florida Association of Realtors. Arlindo mentioned that he and I have been speaking for the past couple of days. We've also been speaking with the FAR attorneys to basically kind of digest this for you and kind of break it down into easier segments instead of you having to do all that. So um, Arlindo has been a, a, a great uh a partner in this for you guys. And so here's what we're gonna show you and feel free to ask questions uh, as we move along. Um, Arlindo, if you can share. It's done. <laughs> okay. Um, here it is. Okay, so can you see this? Not yet, it's coming. Yes, now we can. Okay, great. <laughs> so this is the newest exclusive buyer brokerage agreement. This just came out and you can tell that it just came out because it says revised July of 2024 from the Florida Realtors. This is on form simplicity. So this is now active. This needs to be used beginning August 17th as we spoke last week about the compensation agreements. This is the second form that is gonna to need to be used beginning August 17th. And as Arlindo mentioned, you must get this form. This is part of the settlement agreement for that NAR antitrust federal lawsuit. If you do not follow NAR's rules, you're breaking the rules and then you're considered not protected by the settlement. And if you're not protected by the settlement, then you're uh, opening yourself up to liability and also the brokerage is going to be liable for acts that are not in compliance with the settlement. So one of the main issues is going to be a lot of testers out there, unfortunately, so a lot of sharks in the water looking for vulnerabilities or looking for buyer agents that are saying, oh, okay, we don't really need to sign this. No one's really going to find out. If you get a buyer that calls you and says, I want you to be my realtor, but I'm not signing any brokerage agreement, you have to say no. And what you're gonna say is to that consumer, they're called consumers now, they're not called clients, saying to that consumer, it is a national requirement, which is, has been adopted by Florida and every single Florida realtor must get this form signed by the buyer. And then so when Arlena and I were on the phone with their lawyers from the Florida Association of Realtors, we said, what if a realtor decides to, hey, I'm going to try and get as many clients as I can. And let's see if I can kind of screw some of the other realtors and not have this broker agreement so I can get more consumers. The penalties are fines. They can include fines. 
They can include penalties, interest, but also suspension. That was one of the big words that they use, suspension. So your license can be suspended. And they take it very seriously because they want a level playing field. They don't want some people using this broker agreement and some people not. So we were told the Florida Association of Realtors is going to take this very seriously. And if you do not have this, you can be liable and be in a lot of trouble and possible suspension. So I suggest strongly that you use this form. Okay, so what is this form? This is actually the original exclusive buyer brokerage agreement with some minor revisions, but this agreement was actually used up until 2016, the last revision, up until 2024. So this agreement has been in effect. If some of you do use it, great. Most likely no one was using it because buyers did not want to sign anything like this, but... As we mentioned, you must use it now. So we're going to go over this because some of you might be seeing it for the first time. Maybe you saw it while you were taking your courses with our Lindo at the school, but we're going to go over it and we're going to talk about exactly what it is and discuss the good parts about it and maybe some difficult parts about it because you're going to get some pushback from buyers about signing this. But there's some things in here that we can explain to them that uh, is beneficial to them. So. Let's start, the, it's an exclusive. So the good news for you as realtors is it's exclusive. So once they sign this with you, they cannot use any other realtor. And you can explain to them if they think they're gonna sign one with you and sign one with someone else and sign one with someone else, these are legally binding agreements. They're gonna be signed by the buyer and the broker or broker's agent. And so this legally binds them to paying you if they do end up buying a property. So one thing you can explain to the buyer is, hey, if you're going to sign three of these, just want you to know that you're going to be responsible for three commissions and you're going to have to pay all three agents. So you're definitely not going to want to have more than one of these out there. So um, paragraph one states the consumer. So you put their name here and the brokerage, one way realty. And it says it's an exclusive right to work with and assist consumer in locating and negotiating the acquisition of suitable real property as described below. Next paragraph talks about the term, which is the duration of this contract. This agreement will begin on, and you pick a beginning date, and will terminate at 11.59 p.m. on an end date. So, what time period should you give yourself? It's completely up to you. This is going to be negotiable. Each client is probably going to suggest something different. Obviously, you can't put a year. Six months, if you can get away with that, might seem a little bit long, but you can consider three months, two months, one month. If you need to get the deal, you can do maybe a couple of weeks or whatnot, but obviously for you as a realtor, the longer, the better. The issue becomes the termination date. And then we're going to talk about a protection period later. But if there is a termination date and then they find the property, you're not going to get paid if the termination date ended before the property is went under contract. So you're going to have to be very mindful of this termination date and the protection period. So a little bit more work is gonna be needed from you, but if you calendar this event or you keep track of each file, just be very, very mindful of this termination date um, because you don't want to be past the termination date. And then the consumers say, well, actually we don't really have a contract. Uh, you don't have to get paid and then you're in trouble there. The good news here in the second part of this paragraph two is, if the consumer enters into a contract that is pending on the termination date, this agreement will continue in effect until the transaction has closed. So let's say you put a month here and you enter into a contract in a month and a, uh, or during that month. 
if the contract is going to close in two or three months, you do not have to continually revise or amend this agreement to extend the termination date. The termination date automatically then attaches to the closing date of the contract. So you're protected there. Property paragraph number three, property. You can list here the type of property. You can put single family or condominiums. Locations can be pretty much anything. Zip codes, uh, counties, cities, um, South Florida. There's no limitation really to the location, they say. Um, one thing that also you're okay with or you're protected is let's say you just put Miami here, Miami condo, and they find a house in Broward that they're interested in. You're still protected because it says consumer is interested in acquiring real property as follows or as otherwise acceptable to consumer. So if consumer then signs a contract that you brought to them and they agree to purchase that property, you're protected. So you don't have to continually amend or revise this agreement. Paragraph four, then it talks about broker's obligations. These are pretty standard and this is similar. This hasn't really changed. You have to act professionally and have knowledge and skill and discuss the property requirements and assist consumer in negotiating. We all know that cooperating with the other agents. Um, section B says that this consumer is aware that you might be working with other buyers, so they're okay with that. 4C says that you can't, you're not going to discriminate against anyone uh, based on race or color or religion. Section 4 says that uh, this is actually pretty good for you as an agent. This section says that the broker does not warrant or guarantee products or services provided by any third party whom broker at consumer's request refers or recommends to consumer. So let's say they ask you if you know any inspectors. And as we've talked before, I always recommend giving more than one, maybe two or three and let them choose. But if you do give one and that turns out that that inspector missed something, uh, you're not responsible for that uh, inspector's negligence. So this protects you there. So this is one of the good things about this agreement. There's some very good protections here for you as an agent. Now, paragraph five, consumer's obligations. 5A is really, really good for you guys. Um, this, were, this is where the exclusive part comes into play. It says that the consumer agrees to conducting all negotiations and efforts to locate suitable property through the broker and referring to broker all inquiries of any kind from real estate licensees, property owners, or any other source. If consumer contacts or is contacted by an owner or a real estate agent who is working with an owner or views a property unaccompanied by broker or you, consumer will at first opportunity advise the owner or agent that that buyer is working with an agent exclusively. So no longer, once this agreement is signed, there's no longer the opportunity for buyer to contact the seller directly. Uh, if they do, they have to tell that owner or that agent for the owner that they're working with you and that they need to contact you. So this is actually quite good for you guys. There's no now any backstabbing or working around or trying to get around you guys to go directly to the seller. So. 5A is actually a very good clause for you guys. 5B just talks about providing information to third parties. C is being available to view properties. D, also very good for agents. D says that the buyer or consumer will indemnify and hold the broker harmless from and against all losses, damages, costs, and expenses of any kind including attorney's fees from any liability to any person that broker incurs because of acting on consumer's behalf. So another great clause for you as an agent for the buyer, 
um, you're not responsible, number one. And if they do try suing you, then you're indemnified for as long as you're acting in good faith on behalf of the buyer. So uh, as I mentioned, another really good clause here. Um, and then 5E says, again, no discrimination. 5S talks, 5F talks about consulting with uh, accountants and attorneys when necessary. Um, G talks about making a diligent good faith effort to perform the contract terms. And then we get to paragraph six, retainer. This is, if you can get it, great. It would be difficult to get it, I understand. This is a retainer. Um, where the buyer would pay you a non-refundable fee to take them around, show them properties, and work with them before a contract is even entered into. Um, it's very rare, but I have been told that some agents are able to get this from certain clients, or no, not clients, consumers. So if you're able to do it, great. Um, mm -hmm. You can try, I don't know if you wanna put that as part of your presentation when you're working with a buyer. Um, if you do, great. Basically, it's they, they're gonna pay you, obviously, as I mentioned, take them around, but also then it says this retainer is in addition to any compensation earned by broker. So let's say you ask them for 500 or $1,000 upfront. Uh, if you're getting paid 3% at closing, this amount is not deducted from that amount. So it's in addition to, and it's non-refundable. So if you can get it, great. Try and get it, I guess, but don't be shocked if the consumer says, I don't think so, I'm not paying you any money up front. So just be, uh, uh, just know about that. So paragraph seven. So this is the big situation here, compensation. This is where we put in the percentages. Broker's compensation is earned when, during the term of this agreement, right? So that's why the termination date is very important. It's earned during the term of this agreement or any renewal or extension, consumer or any person acting for on behalf of the consumer contracts to acquire property in this agreement. This compensation is for broker services for consumer Compensation, this is the very important sentence that you're gonna to want to show the buyer because this is where it talks about what you're gonna get from the listing agent or the seller. Compensation received by broker, you, if any, from an owner or owner's broker for services rendered to consumer will reduce any amount owed by consumer per this paragraph. So basically, you're going to put 3% here, and you're going to tell the buyer that uh, you're going to work on getting 3% from the seller. If the seller gives 3%, then the buyer doesn't have to give anything. Now, you're going to probably get a question that says, well, what if they don't offer 3%? This contract actually says that you're entitled to 3% from the buyer. If the seller gives 2% or 2.5%, that difference has to come from the buyer. Um, and we're also going to talk about some questions come up. Well, what if I put zero here? I don't want anything from the buyer. We're just going to get it from the seller. The problem with putting zero here is that it says on paragraph 14, broker may not receive compensation from any source that exceeds the amount or rate agreed to with consumer. So if you put zero here, even if the seller offers 3%, you can't accept it because you have an agreement that says you're not going to get any percentage at time of closing. Or let's say you put one or two percent. That's all you're entitled to, even if the seller is offering three percent. So it's very important for you to put three percent here. And actually, you're not going to put it here. You're going to put it on this second section here. 
because One Way Realty uh, charges a $370 broker processing fee. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna put 3% here in this section plus 370. You're not gonna put anything here because it says or, so you can't put both. So you're gonna put the 3% here. And if you've worked on maybe a flat fee, this is what this dollar amount is for. If you have an agreement with the buyer for a flat fee, you put that here. But most likely you would put 3% here plus 370 on the second line, okay? Now, we also got questions about, well, can I put maybe in the additional term section here, or can I put 0-3% or give it a range or, you know, just say it's dependent on what the seller uh, is offering. Uh, according to NAR's website, the question is, in the buyer agreement, can buyers or buyer brokers agree to a range of compensation? The answer is no. Under the settlement, any compensation agreed to in the written buyer agreement must be objectively ascertainable and not open-ended. And then it says, for example, a written buyer agreement cannot have a commission that is buyer broker compensation shall be whatever amount the seller is offering to the buyer. Or you cannot even put between X or Y percent. So if you're thinking, ah, maybe I can put a range here, the answer is no, you cannot. You must put 3%. Now, as our Linda and I were talking, this could be an issue. What happens if the seller says, well, what if they're only offering two and a half percent? I don't want to pay you that a half percent. What you can tell the buyer is, or the consumer is, if that situation does happen, we can amend this agreement or we can enter into a new agreement changing that amount. That's one thing that we thought you could possibly do. So, but until that happens, it is strongly encouraged to put 3% because whatever amount you do put here, that's the maximum amount you'll be able to get at time of closing. Okay, 7B, it talks about leases. Of course, this settlement is not required for leases. However, if you do get a buyer that says, hey, I'm interested in South Florida, I'm moving down. Um, I'm either looking to buy or to lease. Uh, you're going to want to put that information here for leases. And I believe it's what, 5% sometimes for you guys. So um, you'd fill out that part there. And then if you're going to do a lease, I recommend doing C, which is the lease with option to purchase. If they do say, well, okay, let's lease it, but I also want to buy it. So let's enter into an option put 3% here for the option amount. So when they do eventually buy it, you're protected at time of closing. Uh, okay, additional fees. On. Okay, so now we go to paragraph eight, the protection period. So this is very similar to the listing agreement. It basically says consumer will compensate broker if within, and if it's left blank, 30 days. 30 days is pretty reasonable, probably something that buyer will agree to. Uh, so you can leave it blank. Days after the termination date. So the termination date above, as we talked about on this paragraph two, the term section. Consumer contracts to acquire any property which was called to consumer's attention by broker or any other person or found by consumer during the term of this agreement. Consumer's obligation to pay broker's fee ceases upon consumer entering into a good faith exclusive buyer brokerage agreement with another broker after the termination date. So kind of a lot there, but basically it says, let's say you have a term of one month um, and you've taken this buyer around and they found a great place, but they found it on the 35th day and they say to themselves, okay, good. Actually, I'm no longer in agreement with my broker. 
I'm going to contact the owner directly and see if I can just contact them and close without a agent. This section protects you for 30 days after that termination date. What it doesn't protect you is after the termination date, this allows consumers to enter into another broker agreement with another broker. And then that broker then takes the baton basically from you. And now they're exclusively representing the buyer and there's no protection period once that happens. So. That's how the protection period works. We're gonna go on to conditional termination. This is also very similar to the listing agreement. It says that at consumer's request, John, John, I, I may have... agree to a conditional terminate the agreement. So the consumer can ask, say, hey, you know, if you have maybe a three month or a six month, hey, it's not working out, I wanna try someone else. It's up to you, it's your option to agree to conditionally terminate or not. You can say no, they're locked into the agreement and they have to use you. Um, if you do want to agree to terminate, you can put a cancellation fee here in this blank. What that cancellation fee is, it's completely negotiable, it's completely up to you. You can put $500, you can put a thousand, you can put 5,000, you can put 10,000, you can put whatever you want here. Obviously it needs to be an amount that the buyer would agree to, um, but there's some protection here in case you've driven them around for months, you work with them and they just can't find anything. If they want to cancel the agreement, you can say yes or no. And if you do say yes, you can ask for some uh, reimbursement but you have to put that amount here if you want to do that. And then paragraph 10, dispute resolution. This is something interesting that they did revise. I guess I'm not sure why, but basically if there is any dispute regarding this agreement, you must first go to mediation. And then the option is if mediation doesn't work, mediation is non-binding. So mediation doesn't work, you can go to litigation. You can hire attorneys and go to court. But then it says, if you don't want to do litigation, if you initial here, then you're agreeing to binding arbitration, where you don't have to go to court. You basically go to arbitration. I like arbitration. It avoids going to court, hiring attorneys. And if you actually lose in court, the prevailing party is entitled to recover reasonable attorney's fees. So you can also have to pay, be forced to pay the other side's uh, attorney's fees. So you might want to consider, I would recommend doing arbitration. It's a lot easier, cleaner. So I'd recommend initialing this section, having the buyer initial here. So it avoids having to go to court. That's what this section means. Assignments, it's assigned to all persons, heirs and representatives. Broker relationship. By a broker will act as a transaction broker. This is a transaction broker agreement. Broker will deal honestly and fairly, will account for all funds, use skill, care, and diligence in the transaction, and will disclose all known facts that materially affect the value of the residential property, which are not readily observable to buyer. Will present all offers and counter offers in a timely manner. So, you know, that question always comes up. You're going to submit an offer and sometimes agents don't submit that offer. They say, well, I'm not going to give that to the buyer. I don't like it. That's, they can't do that. That's unethical and it doesn't follow the ethics rules. Uh, all offers and counter offers must be presented in a timely manner to the consumer or the seller. Uh, okay, other terms, you can put something here if there's anything. So here was the main, the big, deal from this whole lawsuit. They wanted to make sure that there was language in this agreement that says broker 
commissions are not set by law. So remember we said that it's not a law. There's no law that happened. There's no case law. There's no statutes. Commissions are completely negotiable. And then as we talked about, broker may not receive compensation an amount more than this. However, this next sentence is also important. Consumer agrees that broker may receive separate compensation from the owner of the property for services rendered to the owner by broker for which consumer will not be responsible. So this sentence means that you can represent the buyer and you can also represent the seller and you will get 6%. It doesn't limit you to only one side. So this allows the broker to represent both sides. You would sign it, consumer would sign it, and then, uh, yeah, so an agent can sign it because it says authorized associate or broker, date it, and then you're good to go in initial bottom sections. So this is the new exclusive buyer brokerage agreement. If you have questions, you can unmute yourself. Uh, and Arlinda, if you have anything to add, please go right ahead. Yes, before we go to the questions, let's add a few things so we make it that even more clear. John already made 100% clear, clear just to make sure we all understand this. When we, when John mentioned at the beginning that we are obligated to use this form, it's not only us from One Way Realty Group, it's every single agent. So don't uh, feel uh, embarrassed or in disadvantage to ask the buyer to sign this form. Because if you don't, somebody else will, because there is no way that any agent can work with the buyer without this form being signed. That's number one. Uh, number two is that this uh, new form came into four different brokerage relationship. One is consent to transition to transaction broker. The other one is single agent. The other one is no brokerage. And the other one is transaction broker. We brought this form here, which is transaction broker, which is the one that we should use. Even though we have four different type of the same form, the one we're going to use is the transaction broker, not single agents, not consent to transition, and not no brokerage relationship. Now, another thing that um, John mentioned is that because buyers are so used to work with four or five different agents, and that's the benefit that I see on this form, is that this will never happen again. You're never going to waste your time showing properties to a buyer, and he end up buying the property that you showed with a different agent. And we know that this thing happens a lot. I use that as an example in our meetings and also in my classroom at Go Coast. Someone has a sister who is an agent but has a full-time job. Then if you have a full-time job, you can get out of your job to show properties to your sister. Then the sister will find someone like me that I'm a full-time real estate agent then I'm going to go out of my office, show the properties. When they finally find the property that they wanted, they tell the sister to write a contract. Do you believe that that thing happened? Yes, it does happen every day. But from now on, this is never going to happen again. Okay? Because they have to sign that thing with you. Now, buyers may be creative and they think, you know what? I'll sign this agreement with four different, if, if I'm obligated to sign it, then I'll sign it. I'll sign with four different agents, but I'll buy only one, one property. All right. So one agent who he signs the contract with will be benefit from the commission and the other three will sue the buyer for the commission. So then we, and not only we from One Way Realty Group, every single agent, because everybody's being benefited from it. They need to warn the buyer and advise the buyer that he cannot sign this agreement with more than one broker or he's going to be liable to the commission to the other broker. So that's something very, very interesting. Now, 
this document now becomes part of the transaction that we need to keep for five years. As we all know, the statute of limitations says that we must keep the files for five years, closing or not closing, we need to keep them for five years, okay? So that's the time that the consumers has to bring a lawsuit against the broker. So you need to get this form in writing, signed, and accompany all the other forms on this transaction, okay? Two, very important, when do you sign this agreement before you show the property? Right, you're not gonna get the buyer and show them a property before you got them sign this agreement. You're gonna sit down with them with the agreement. You're gonna explain to them, and you're also gonna explain them the reason why they are now required to sign this agreement because this is something that the uh, new rule from NAR that this form all that existed but was not required, but now became required. And if he doesn't sign them with you. You're going to have to sign with somebody else. So you're not in disadvantage with the other agents. Now, this new rule make us all equal. Okay? So we are now all on the same page. Um, right. To that point, be careful with saying, okay, I'm just going to send this brokerage agreement when I send the offer after we do showings and things like that. Actually, the rule states that before you view a house, you need to have this brokerage agreement in place. So obviously, as soon as you uh, enter into some sort of verbal agreement with the buyer that says you're going to represent them, you have to send this agreement before you show any houses. Good. So the last but not the least is the thing that John already mentioned about changing does this form so as we uh as uh, john mentioned john can you scroll down to to 14 paragraph 14 please so it's in bold that says that the broker may not receive compensation from any source that exceeds the amount of rate agreed with consumer, meaning if you put 3% here and the buyer, um, actually differently, if you put 2% here and the seller pays you 3%, you won't be able to collect the 3% because as this paragraph states that you cannot receive more than you charge to the consumer. So this is what we're going to try to do. We're going to put 3%, okay? And we are going to explain the buyer that if we agree, this is important, we have to sell yourself. How well you sell yourself depends on you. We do have a list of all the services that we provide as buyer's broker. John already posted that list previously in our chat, and I asked John to do it again. So you can have this sent to your buyer by his email so he understand what are all the services that you're going to provide. So when you are working uh, with the buyer, you can explain them. If you want to receive less than 3%, let's say you're happy with 2% or you're happy with 2.5%, but this agreement states 3%. So on your negotiation with the buyer, you can tell the buyer, look, uh, once we find the property that she that um, uh, suits you, I will communicate with the seller and I will find out what will be the commission. If the commission is 2.5%, we're going to modify this agreement to reflect 2.5% so you don't have to pay me half percent if that is what you wish. If you still want to receive 3%, you don't have to change the agreement. You're going to get 2.5% from the seller and the buyer is going to have to pay you 0.5%. And believe me, all these are going to try to get as much as they can. So you're going to find the right place for yourself because you are a player on this game. So you're going to have to choose your acceptable commission. If you accept the less and you don't care about anybody else, then you tell the buyer that you're going to change, modify this agreement 
to reflect the commission that the seller is going to pay you so the buyer won't have to pay you anything. We good? Now, I point out every single items that I thought we should talk a little bit more about it. Now it's open to you guys. If you have any question, please feel free to ask. Now is the time. So uh, I have a question about the uh, if you want to make an amendment to the agreement, do you have to uh, get it to an addendum? How do you do that? Right now, they haven't presented any modification agreements to this. Maybe that will come up. But if it doesn't, if by August 17th, they don't have a modification agreement like they do for the compensation agreement, then you would need to do a new one of these. And the reason that we can do a new one of these is actually the, back in that section, it says this agreement cannot be changed except by written agreement signed by both parties. So this is where we're deducing the fact that you might not be able to do an addendum. You might be, they haven't presented to us, but to be 100% safe at this point in time, it'd be best just to have another one of these agreements signed. Yes, I have another question. The return of fee, is it paid to the broker or agent? All fees are technically supposed to go to the broker. So it goes to the broker and then the broker distributes based on whatever percentage uh, you guys have agreed to. And another question that has come up is, let's say you're a listing agent. Uh, you're not required to ask the buyer's agent, let's say they come for a showing, you do not have to ask the buyer's agent for a copy of this agreement. There's no obligation to do that. You can show homes, you can show units, without requiring the buyer's broker to give you a copy of this buyer broker agreement. Another question that does come up is, what if you're a listing agent and a consumer you're doing an open house and the neighbor comes over and they don't have a realtor and they say, um, I wanna to tour the house. The listing agent does not need to get this agreement signed because at that point in time, the listing agent is still working for the seller. So in the listing agreement, let's say that that, buy, that buyer then decides to purchase, the listing agreement will entitle, if you do put 6%, the listing agreement is, the listing agent is still entitled to whatever amount is put on the listing agreement. So if you put 6% total, then the listing agent is still entitled to 3% if the buyer does not have an agent. Now, one thing that you might wanna consider is, let's say you do have a, a neighbor that comes over, they show the house, you show them the house, they say they don't have an agent, uh, you prepare the contract, but then all of a sudden, of course, oh, actually I do have an agent. My sister's an agent. She's going to be the one on the contract. Um, to prevent that from happening, if you are at a listing and you do have a listing for a seller, it might be advantageous for you to have some broker agreements handy. And if you do get a neighbor that does come over, um, you might want to consider having them sign a broker agreement so that will prevent them from later saying to you, actually, I do have an agent. Um, so something to consider. Uh, yes, Estabilis, go ahead. Hi, uh, so I have two questions. Hi. One is for Arlindo and one is for you, John. So the, Arlindo, the first question is, this contract is between broker and consumer. Uh, so I want to know what is One Way Realty's preference uh, for signing this contract? Is it the broker or the, the agent? No, you can sign it. Okay. You can sign it. That's the one thing that we need to keep in mind is that the penalties are going to be applied 
to all ages, not only one-way realty group agents, all ages that decided to work with the buyer without this agreement. Because, you know, this is one of the things that we were talking, me and, and John, you mm -hmm. know, for hours we have in this conversation. We are in Miami and people want to take advantage of other people. People sometimes they don't care to step in somebody else's toes. So if they decided to call the buyers and say, you know what, I'm going to work with you without this agreement, there are going to be penalties, right? And one of the penalties will be suspension. They're going to be banned from the MLS. That's that's the first thing that's going to happen. They're going to be banned from the MLS, meaning they can no longer list the property and they can no longer search for property from the MLS. Done. If you can't do that, then you, you're done. The next one is that your license could be suspended and the maximum suspended is 10 years. So those things can happen. And as John mentioned, and I advise you guys, very important about this, is that don't fall on someone's question when they call you because there are going to be testers. I remember in 2021, there were testers, the calling listing agents for rental properties. And the question they were asking is, was actually, I have a criminal record. Is the association going to a, a, approve my application? And I had agents, not luckily, because we do this meeting all the time and we have, you guys have me to support you anytime you have a question. No one of our agents fall for that. But I had people calling me. I remember in April, I was in Turkey and someone called me and said, Orlando, I got this problem because they said to the person on the other line that no, they are not going to be approved. And they file a lawsuit against them saying they violate the Fair Housing Act and the Fair Housing Act is a federal law and has to be resolved in the federal court. So they had testers back then. They were making $7,000 for every single agent that made the mistake. They're going to have testers now. And please, that was to tell you guys, follow the rule. Follow the law. Buyer calls you and say, oh, I want to work with you, but I don't want to sign this uh, agreement. Don't say no. You, you explain them. Look, if you don't sign them with me, you're going to have to sign with somebody else because that's the new rule. There's no way that you can work with an agent without this form to be signed. Good. Okay. Answer your question? Yes. All right. Great. And uh, the second question, John, is, is for you with respect to the protection period. If I got a little confused at the end. I understand that if the contract has been signed, although it has not closed and it's within the, the, the term, we're covered. Yes. But but you mentioned that regardless if it has expired, the buyer, the seller, the, the buyer could uh, sign with another agent. I was a little lost there. Right. So let's say the termination date is today, July 25th. You're protected for 30 days to August 25th if that buyer purchases a property that you've shown to that buyer. However, you're not protected during that extended 30 days if the buyer hires another agent and then uses that agent to purchase a property that you showed to that buyer. So during the agreement, the buyer is locked into you. They can't use another agent. But during the protection period of 30 days, if they do hire another agent and sign an agreement, your ability to get paid from the consumer ceases and the consumer is only obligated to pay the new agent and not you during that protection period the, basically the protection period goes away so so it's it's a protection a questionable protection <laughs> put it that way okay good Don't point do. 
Understood. Yes, it protects the buyer from going directly to the seller um, and trying to work a side deal with the seller or seller's agent. So that's where you're protected. Um, but yeah, it's, I guess, yeah, good point. It's a partial protection period. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's Thanks. a partial protection, but it will be a full protection if you work with the for sale by own, which is not being represented by an agent. If the buyer goes directly to the for sale by owner, then you are 100% protected. But if the buyer goes to the listing agent and the listing agent have the buyer to sign this agreement, as the paragraph states, if the buyer signs the agreement with another agent, then it's void. The protection period is not valid anymore. Correct, John? Yes. Okay. Uh, Isis, you have a question? Yes, um, I had a I have a question, but I wanted to ask in reference to what, what to the last question from the the other lady. Um, mm -hmm. As a listing agent, as um, if the well, no, what what Arlindo was just saying as a if the if the buyer wants not as a listing agent, erase that, but as a buy if if your consumer as a buyer waits the 30 days and has wants to make a deal directly with the owner then it's only third that's it you're not protected that's correct after the protection period if it's left blank it's 30 days you can put it in a different amount if you like but basically on day 31 yes so you can, can put you can put um so you can put for example three months you can put 90 days sure and yes. that way that buyer cannot work a deal with with the owner themselves correct and then the other one, it's uh, it's conditional based on them uh, them signing with a new agent, regardless of who that agent will be, whether it's a listing agent or any other agent. Then that then the the the, the wait period or the protection period is voided once they sign with someone else. Correct. Yes. Okay. Um. Understood. Now, come back to my original my 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 question was in number seven, where it talks about lease to own options. Um. When you were talking about um option the lease option to so if the lease, if you sign a this agreement with with someone who's a lessee who's leasing a property this contract will expire let's say three months four months so when they're going to buy that property you're no longer protected because the agreement has already expired right so let's take another look at that section so it's section c it says broker will be paid a certain amount of the option amount to be paid when consumer enters into the option agreement if consumer enters into a lease with option to purchase broker will be compensated for both the lease and the option so uh, no. Let I understand me, your question. The question is when, right? But go ahead, Orlando. Yeah, let me add something because it it's not going to apply for the example you gave. If the tenant leases a property, that's not an option contract. That's just a lease agreement. If later on the the tenant decides to buy and you don't have an agreement with the the tenants and the tenant uh, deals directly with the owner to purchase, then you are out. This is if you have an option contract. What is an option contract? It's a rent with an option to purchase. And that's something that's already set when you sign the contract. Example, the tenant says, I'll rent your property today for $5,000 a month. And in one year from now, I'll buy your property for $1.5 million. That's an option contract. So you are going to receive a commission for the lease and you're also going to receive a commission for the sell. But that only applies if you have an option contract. Oh, okay. I understand. It was, it's too, right. I confused it with just the leasing contract. So it would, it's a set, it's a lease to option. It's an option to a lease, option to buy separate contract than a regular lease. Correct. I understand now. Um, What if the, what if the owner sells to, if they, if, if an owner's if an owner signs a lease to buy option contract, um can they sell to somebody else that's not no. the person? No, it's a unilateral contract. Unilateral contract means that only one party is obligated to, to perform. And in that case, it's the optionor. And who is the optionor? Owner slash landlord. So meaning the owner landlord cannot uh sell to any other person. 
the tenant slash buyer, who is the option E, he's not obligated to perform, meaning during this one time period, if the buyer, landlord, or buyer tenants decide not to purchase, then he can cancel the contract. Of course, he's going to lose the liquidated damage, which is the deposit that he made, but he's not obligated to perform. The landlord slash owner, who is the option or is obligated to perform, even if he receives a better offer, he can now walk away from an option contract. Okay, got it. Thank you. Good job. Thank you so much for the explanation. All right. I have a question. I have a question for Orlando. For those of us to work um, with, you know, pre-construction, and you know, most pre-construction, sometimes they give you a time, like, let's say they, they're going to close in 30 days, then they extend it, extend it, keep it, keep it. How does can that apply to us? Like, how can we, All right, based we, on the agreement? We mentioned that. Once you're under contract, your agreement with the buyer already extended until the date of closing. Okay. Isn't that right, John? Isn't that what we read? That's correct. Yes. As soon as you enter into the contract, even though, like you're saying, Gabriel, it's a pre-construction and it's closing in three years, as long as you've entered into that contract right here, if consumer enters into an agreement to acquire to purchase anything, you're protected. So you're protected under these types of agreements for pre-construction. Yes. Are we good, Gabriel? Thank you. All right, so we have two questions here on our chat. I will answer one, which is directly to me, and John, please enter the other one. One is uh, Balkis. Uh, do you want, Arlindo, do you want to sign as well? No, I don't need to sign. You can sign it, okay? Do you want a copy of this every time they are signed or only when the buyer and seller sign a contract to purchase? No. I need a copy of this agreement every time you signed. Now, remember, if this contract becomes part of the documents that we need to keep for a transaction, either the transaction closed or not closing, we are still obligated to keep the files for five years. So let's say two years from now, this, the buyer decides to bring a lawsuit against you for something and you don't have the, the agreements to prove that you did the right thing and you were really represent the buyer. So we need to keep all this documentation. So meaning every time that you sign it, you need to send me a cop so I can keep a file for five years. Now, it's excellent question, Max, that leads me to uh, warn all of you guys that every single transaction, closing or not closing, you guys need to keep the files. Of course, you're going to send them to me, but don't rely on me, okay? Don't rely only on me. You are also going to be keep the copy of all those files. We had a situation a year ago with, with one of our agents. She was the listing agent representing the buyer and the seller on the same transaction, and the transaction did not close. The buyer did not meet all the requirements and didn't close. So the listing agent ended up selling the property to another buyer. So she was lucky enough to represent both parties on the, on the same transaction twice. So what happened is that a year later or a year, two years later, the previous buyer uh, um, uh, filed a lawsuit against the listing agent because the listing agent did not sell the property to him and decided to sell to another buyer. So if the listing agent and myself, we, not, we did not keep all the files and all the communication, we exchanged it through emails or text messages, we would not be able to prove that the reason why it didn't close was because the buyer could not meet all the requirements for closing. And then the transaction fell apart and we were forced to sell to another buyer. So... Meaning, guys, don't rely only on me. Keep all the files also in your computer. You don't have to keep a hard copy. You can scan the documents and, and create a folder for every single transaction and keep all the files inside that folder. Good? John, Galaxy S10e, got a question for you, please. 
Yeah, it looks like the question is when I have off the market property, also have to fill in the agreement. So um, when you say I, if you're speaking about, if you're a listing agent and we're talking about listing agreements, those are still the same. We've been told that possibly next week we will get some revisions to the listing agreement. But based on the changes made to this broker agreement, which is basically the same, and the main thing that they did change was this section where basically they're saying that the consumer and the broker commissions are negotiable. I'm assuming the same thing is going to happen with the listing agreements, where it's basically going to be the same. So the listing agreements must obviously be signed between the seller and you. Um, if you have a buyer come to you directly, as we mentioned in that listing agreement, I believe you guys put 6%. And if you bring the buyer or you put a section in there, it says you're a transaction broker. And if you're representing a buyer, it's also 3%. Um, that's still in place. You get the 6%. And like I mentioned, you might want to consider signing this agreement with that buyer that does come to you without an agent uh, in case they try getting an agent later. And also, it is going to be your responsibility. If you do consider signing this brokerage agreement with a buyer, you must ask them, are you represented by any other agent? And if they say no, then you can sign it. If they say yes, then you have to say to them, I cannot enter into an agreement with you. I need to speak with your agent. So be very careful with that. But the listing agreements are going to be still in full force and effect. All right. So adding to what John just explained, in your case, it's off market property, meaning you don't have a listing agreement. So whatever agreement you have with the seller will replace the listing agreement. As in the same thing will be exactly how John explained. Okay. So if you have off market property, meaning you don't have a listing agreement, but you do have a commission agreement, right? If you have a commission agreement that says that they're going to pay you uh, 6% and you're going to split your 6% with buyers. Well, what I understand and what I know about off-market properties, the seller only pays the listing agent a commission, which is not actually a listing agent. And whoever brings the buyer, the buyers are going to have to pay the broker's commission because in general, those type of property that's off-market the price is lower than any other property that is listed on the MLS, okay? So meaning maybe on this off-market property, you are receiving only the commission to yourself and you're not splitting to anyone. Then you don't need this because you're not splitting your commission with the brokers. Now, if you're charging the seller more than what you're keeping because you're going to have to split your commission with the buyers, then exactly as John explained, it will be better for you to get the buyer to sign a disagreement because in the future, a near future, the buyer can bring another broker to buy the property and then you just miss the commission. All right? So I don't know who Galaxy S10 is, but do you get your question answered? Yes. Thank you, Arlindo. Thank you, John. Shelly, how are you? Yeah. Shelly? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I recognize your voice. Okay. <laughs> yes, All right, guys. So Any other question? There is one here, or no, it looks like Veronica's question is, and it's a good one. I have a buyer. We've actually did a contract already last month. It's closing in September. MLS says 3%. What do I have to do? Um, Beginning August 17th, the requirement is that these forms must be used. So you will need to have this form signed on August 17th for all current files. Because even though you have now MLS says 3%, that's going to be deleted and it's no longer going to be there. And it's no longer going to control any closings after August 17th. So 
you will have to get the compensation agreement signed between the brokers and you will need to get this agreement signed with the buyer. Uh, Veronica, the most important thing is that you to get yes, I, uh, I, I, you know, buyer I broker, uh -huh. buyer to uh, uh, bro listing broker agreement. The one okay. that you mentioned on the previous uh, meeting. Yes, I know. That is what you're going to guarantee your commission. Okay, any any contract that was signed prior to August 17 and is going to close after August 17 that we know that we're not going to use yeah. MLS as a reference uh, okay. to commission to cooperating brokers, then it would be wise to have the commission agreement between you and the listing agent. Okay? Yes, I, yes. I received the one uh, document to uh, you. review and they made a mistake. And that's something you need to understand which form you're going to use. There is one form that's seller to buyer's broker. That form you're going to use only if your commission comes directly from the seller. And there is a second form that is uh, listing broker to buyer's broker. So if your commission doesn't come directly from the seller, but comes from the broker, the listing broker, then you need to use the second form, send it to the broker and the broker is going to sign. You keep that on file. You're going to send it to the title company. And I'm sure you're using John like everybody else in our company uses John. So John will know that the commission that will have to be deducted from the um the seller's net procedures and pay to you to be whatever uh, states on that agreement. So basically the difference is why is there a difference between the two forms? The seller to buyer's broker, you can think of being used for for sale by owners when maybe they're not represented by a broker or sometimes sellers will use a company that charges $500 just to list the property on the MLS, but they're not acting really as an agent or a broker. So those are the circumstances that you would use that form, seller to buyer's broker. Otherwise, most likely if it's on the MLS, listing agents have uh, listing agreements with sellers that says 6%, three and three. And so you would use the seller's broker to buyer's broker form. That's the difference between the two. Yeah. And one thing important, I've been saying this since this thing started, but some people, you know, we have conversation outside and people are getting uh, uh, negative about all those things. What I believe, and I've seen already this thing happening, is that every single listing agent will continue charging the seller, the buyer's commission, buyer's broker commission. They will continue doing that. I am helping one of our agents to get a listing from a seller and we charge them 6%. And on the listing agreement, we put that is 3% to the listing agent and 3% to the cooperating broker. So everybody will continue. And I suggest to you guys, when you work with the sellers, you do the same thing. Continue charging whatever you use to charge because commissions are negotiable. And always were negotiable. You charge 6%. The seller accepted. Well, he accepted. That's a form of negotiation, right? And if the seller says, oh, I'm not going to pay you 6%, I'll pay you 5%. That's also a negotiation. Accepting and counter offer is part of the negotiation. So you will continue charging whatever you charge. And you're going to continue offer compensation to the buyer's broker agreement. And this wheel will never stop turning. It's just something that happened that changed the things, the way we do business. And a lot of people get scared about it. But in fact, when August 17 comes, nothing actually is going to change. John, would you like to add anything to this? Yes. Uh, actually, it looks like Belkis put a question in the chat about uh, even though the law doesn't go into effect until August, should we wait until then to start using these forms? 
if you have a closing that is going to close after August 17th, which is now what, three weeks away, I would suggest using these forms now because on August 17th, you're gonna to need to use them. So as part of the offer and as part of all the documents, I would get this agreement signed and I would definitely get the compensation agreement signed by the broker. So start being aware that you're gonna to start to see these forms in circulation before August 17th. And it's a very good practice to use them now. So when we get to August 17th, you're not scrambling, trying to get these things signed. And what if a buyer says, I'm not gonna sign it. And then you have an issue with that or the seller changes the compensation agreement on August 17th, because they know maybe these forms have been now in effect and they don't wanna use them. So it would be imperative if you enter into a contract beginning today or moving forward, that you include these two additional forms, this broker agreement and the compensation agreement. And if you have any questions, when to use it and how to use it, how to fill it up, you have me and John that you can call and we're gonna help you to fill up the form. Good? One question. Yes? Um. So basically everything pretty much remains the same except for additional paperwork, in other words. Um, but what I was at, but basically what I was, is it, maybe I, I don't know if I imagined this or if I, if I heard it, um, isn't it that the main difference is it that in the MLS, the listing agent will not be putting in the percentage that they're offering. Is that basically the main change? Two changes, basically. Um, that's one of them. The MLS section will be removed from the MLS that has the portion of compensation to buyer agents. It will no longer be there. It will no longer be a field to enter in that information. It's going to be completely deleted. So that's for example, if, okay, uh -huh. go ahead. I'm sorry. And then the, the second part is the settlement required that buyers enter into brokerage agreements with broker agents, with buyer agents. Those are the two basic resolutions of that settlement. So basically the only, so because that's information that as, a, as an agent we look at, and for example, there's two houses selling around the same price point, but one is uh, even for rentals, like they'll offer like literally like $300 to an agent when the other one is 50% of one month's rent or 5% or what have you. And you're showing exactly the same properties nearby. And obviously you're going to gravitate to the one that's not paying $200 <laughs> for, for commission or a house that's in the same neighborhood within two blocks. And one is 3% and the other one has six. So as an agent, obviously we're going to gravitate toward, I mean, maybe it's not fair or whatever, but we're going to gravitate to the one that has the higher percentage. So now it just basically as with a once you're representing a buyer, if you want to know what that percentage is going to be, it's just extra work and phone and a phone call to have to ask how much is how much come and how to word that, how do I word that appropriately to a listing agent, basically. Okay. Just ask. You period. said a couple of good things there. Um you're right, the market is going to continue to control. Basically, if you have one unit that's offering 0% offer of compensation and you have a neighboring unit offering 3%, obviously, you're going to be able to tell your seller, hey, look, we're actually at a little bit of lower price, but we're not getting any showing requests because your neighbor is offering 3% and everyone's going there. It's called steering. Steering legally or ethically is unethical you're not allowed to do that does it happen yes of course it's human nature but you're not allowed to do that because ethically as an agent you're supposed to be putting your interests uh, aside from your buyer interests the buyer interests are supposed to control instead of yours so um, you're not allowed to do that i don't recommend you saying to the buyer hey that unit's only offering one percent commission let's go to this one um no, obviously, of course not i yeah. mean obviously we wouldn't say that right. <laughs> we wouldn't say that but 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 yes. if i'm going to be working for example i work with uh, I have rentals and the rentals will be they literally put up will put fifty dollars um like there'll be owners that are listing it owner agents and they'll put fifty dollars so 
Am I going to run around with a client for for just a rental commission for fifty dollars when a neighboring unit? No, I'm not going to tell the client, obviously, but it's a little bit ridiculous. Now, the only yeah. thing is that right now from the MLS listing, then basically we would have to call the listing agent and say, how much commission is the buyer? I mean, it's a seller offering. Is that would that be the correct terminology to ask the listing agent? Right. So this is how this is going to play out. You're going to see a unit that you have a buyer interested in. So you're going to call that listing agent. You're going to say, hi, my name is Isis. I am a buyer's agent. I have a buyer interested in unit 2305 at the Porsche. Yeah, go high. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to say, is it available? Number one, right? So this is still business as usual. Is it available? Or they're going to say yes. And your next question usually is, okay, what are the showing uh, instructions, right? And they're going to say whatever they say. And then your third question is going to be straightforward. What's the offer of compensation? Okay. And they're going to say, and they're going to know they're going to be, if it's 3%, they'll be happy to say 3%. And then you're going to say, okay, great. I'm going to send over this, uh, the compensation agreement, please sign it and send it back. Okay. And that's how it's basically going to play out. So everyone's going to know if hopefully they have brokers like Arlindo who's available and do these instructional videos and seminars that instructs them about the new rules. And so everyone's going to know this is the new norm. This isn't changing. This is a settlement agreement. This is what's going to be happening. Um, it is a little bit more work, but the realtors at One Way Realty that I know that I've spoken to, you guys can do this. It's just a little bit of extra paperwork. Um, but don't worry, Arlindo and I are here for you if you have any questions as we move forward through this. Thank you so much. So it's basic. Basic is one more question when calling a listing agent and a couple more forms. <laughs> Correct. Exactly. Basically. I have a question. I have a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Delia. Go ahead. Uh, I have already a listing, okay? Do I have to change the listing agreement with my client now? No, or this is only for the buyer? Not at this time because they have not sent out the new listing agreement forms. Um, they said they're coming out next week. So when they do come out, Arlindo and I will again review those. Uh, chew them up, as uh, Lindo says, and, and we'll have answers for you regarding that. So maybe like the compensation agreement, they'll have a modification addendum that can be used. Right now, we don't know, so we don't like to guess, but we're told it's coming out next week. We'll take a look at it and we'll let you guys know as soon as we hear from them regarding those forms. Okay. Okay. Yes, uh, Thank you so very much. Mm -hmm. I have a question. You're always going to find some dishonest listing agent. Let's say uh, you call the agent and the agent say, okay, the sellers only pay percent commission. And at closing, you realize that like, the listing agent get 4% and you get 2%. How can you fight that? Well, that's what's good about these new compensation agreements. You're going to get this signed before any of that. So as in that previous example on the phone call, they're saying to you, let's say they say 2%. Okay, you can still negotiate that, right? So as we've said, and as the settlement agreement says, commissions are negotiable. So you don't have to accept that 2%. You can say, I have a full price buyer. We're not, I'm not going to take 2%. I want 3%. Maybe they come back with two and a half. So you can still negotiate the commission. Once you come up to that amount, then you send that compensation agreement and then you're locked into that. So if you accept 2%, you send over a compensation agreement, they sign it at 2%. Regardless of what they're getting, you're getting 2% at closing. Okay, because the reason why I ask that, let's say uh -huh. if I have a listing and the seller willing to pay 5%, is it legal to say, or if it's uh, to say, okay, I'm going to get 3% at the listing agent as the listing agent and 2% to the uh, buyer's agent? Is okay, it legal? Actually, that's a very good question, Gabriel. So it depends what's in your listing agreement, right? So in your listing agreement, which is a contractual agreement between you and the seller, 
the seller says, I'm giving you 5%. And then in that agreement, you say, okay, if there is a cooperating broker, I'm going to give them two and a half percent. Or let's say the listing agreement says 6% and then the cooperating broker gets 3%. That's an agreement that you're saying you're going to do for the seller. So the best interest of the seller is to offer 3% to the buyer's agent. If you only offer 2.5%, you can be in trouble for that because now you're in default of the agreement that you had with the seller. And if the seller ever finds out that you're only offering 2.5% to the buyer, um, that's unethical because you're not putting your seller's interests before yours, you're putting your interest before theirs. So you cannot do that if you have a listing agreement that says three and three, you cannot offer the buyer two or two and a half. Let's say uh, the scenario that, that I just told you, let's say at closing and then you, can you request the listing agent to disclose the listing agreement to see what was originally in the listing agreement? Let's say if they say the listing agreement say 3% for each, agent and then at closing you you say the uh, the listing agent say okay we only the seller only provide two percent and you realize realize like he's getting four percent you're getting two percent can you ask him to disclose the listing agreement at the time of closing it's too late you can ask but you've already agreed if you have a compensation agreement signed to accept the two percent this is an agreement between the brokerages so now you have a written agreement so the good news with this new compensation agreement is it's going to prevent what you're saying uh, at closing finding out that the seller's getting four percent and you're only getting two percent these new compensation agreements are going to prevent that but Previously, it would have been too late. You would have agreed to the 2%, which was on the MLS. The MLS does not need to disclose the listing agent's commission. Remember, the list, the MLS is only for buyer's agents. If you present a contract, you're accepting that 2% that was on the MLS, and the listing agent could have got whatever they wanted. So these new agreements are going to prevent those issues from happening. Okay, so any other questions? We don't want to take Thank too you, much John. time. Yeah, sure, Gabe, anytime. Okay, it's 1.30. Uh, I'll release the screen. There's going to be obviously more questions that come up. Feel free to email me or Arlindo, put it in the chat or contact us directly. I'm sure next week we most likely will have another meeting. If not, uh, we'll have one when the listing agreement form comes out. So as I mentioned, we're here for you guys. Arlindo, back to you. All right, great. Thank you. So, guys, we are going to continue regardless if we're going to have the new um, the new form released because I understand that at the beginning there will be a lot of questions. You know, we hear things today and then tomorrow we forget or half an hour after the meeting we all don't remember half of the things we heard. So we are going to schedule more frequently meeting until all this thing is understood by all of you guys and as john mentioned and i already mentioned that before you got me and john any questions you have give us a call don't do anything if you're not 100 percent sure before you call us and get the uh answer for the questions you have now guys if you have any questions after that you can give me a call and you can um call john right so we are ending this meeting and I'm going to repeat myself. Got any questions? Give me a call. All right, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Arlindo. Thank, Thank you, Arlindo. Thank, Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, John, one more time. It was a great meeting. Bye.